Hey, it's another Optiplex. Model 745. This is another refugee from the hall, and is probably the second best of the bunch, which isn't really saying a whole lot. It's got DVD and CD readers in front, along with an old-school floppy drive, USB ports, and a microphone and a headphone jack. And in the back, your old-school serial and parallel ports, along with Ethernet, USB, and audio ins and outs. There's also a handy VGA graphics port built into the motherboard. Almost any graphics card would be an improvement, but we'll get to that later. It came with a Celeron D installed. However, the manual says we can do much better. But first, let's take a quick look inside. We got PCI slots. Room for a single slot video card and something else. The inability to fit a larger video card is a limiting factor, but with careful selection of our video board, we can make this work just fine. We have room for two disk drives, and you have to love the easy to use blue caddies. We have four memory slots. It came with four gigs installed. Let's push this baby up to eight gigs. Always read the fine manual. Manufacturers usually offer models with better features, but we usually don't find them in the wild. We find the cheap stuff. But first things first, how about a nice BIOS update? Well, that was quick. Now we check the BIOS screen. Cool. The upgrade took. Now we can drop in something a little snazzier than the Pentium D. We'll replace the Celeron D with a processor that I looted from another system from the hall. It's an Intel Core 2 Duo E4500 processor, clocking at 2.2 GHz. It can probably take a faster processor, with a faster clock speed and bus speed, but this is good enough. If you don't need to spend the money, why bother? Two screws loosen up the heatsink, and it tilts to one side. We can then remove the heatsink, making replacing the CPU easier. After replacing everything and booting it up, we can check the BIOS. And we have dual cores! Since I'm real suspicious about older OEM power supplies, we'll get an EVGA power supply during one of their scratch and dent sales. It'll replace the stock 300 watt supply. This gives me plenty of headroom if I wanted to do more upgrades, like put in a lightweight gaming card. I replaced the floppy drive with a card reader. Our local electronics store had a few on sale and it makes the front look a lot more modern. We'll pop in our trusty NVIDIA GT220 video card because 48 CUDA cores is better than no CUDA cords. The way the PCI slots are laid out, we're limited to a single slot graphic card. For now, the GT220 will do the job. And for sound, we have a real treat, an all real card. It's an oldie, but it's sweet. Add a refurbished 320 gig hard drive and X Ubuntu, and we have my main audio computer. I installed the low latency kernel for a little extra performance boost. I've been upgrading and experimenting with my standalone DAW when I can get something better on the cheap. As I get more experience and hardware, my systems keep evolving. It's a good thing. My present microphone is a real piece of history. A Radio Shack Highball High Impedance Microphone. It was cheap when I bought it ages ago, but it's held up fairly well. The pop filter really helps a lot. 
I use an external mixer that's also a cassette tape deck. I've got some old and obscure music on cassette that needs to be digitized. The mixer is a bit noisy, but Audacity has decent noise reduction. It's not something I'd recommend, but I had it available. Eventually, I'll upgrade to something better. So I use Audacity for voiceovers and for transferring old cassettes into a digital format. I use MuseScore for sheet music, and I use LMMS as my rough and ready digital audio workstation. I don't do much of my composition on this particular computer, just work out some rough drafts. This machine was going to the recycle center, but with some cheap upgrades, it's a dirt cheap digital audio workstation. Thanks for watching, and remember to stay curious.